Okay, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, today we have the Memory Studies group of the Graduate School Humanities. Uh, the Memory Studies group is an interdisciplinary uh, working group consisting of six PhD students whose dissertations include theories of memory studies. The small research group gathers regularly to discuss the newest approaches to memory studies and share their current research. Members include Joshua Bogat, Leo von Bach, and, uh, and Christina Zeffeld. Um, Joshua Bogat has a Stadt examen in Latin, Classical Greek, and Chemistry from the universities Freiburg, Heidelberg, and Bologna. Uh, currently, he's a PhD student in Classics at the University of Freiburg, where he researches uh, collective and individual grief in antiquity. He is particularly interested in the fields of narratology, discourse analysis, grief and emotion research, as well as memory studies. And we have uh, Lea von Bach, who is a doctoral student at the Medieval German Language and Literature Department of the University of Freiburg. Her research project focuses on the historiographic writings of, of a female convent in the 15th and 16th century. She holds an MA uh, degree in Medieval and Renaissance Studies from the University of Fre uh, Freiburg. And lastly, we have Christina Zeffeld, uh, whose face you're familiar uh, with at this point. And she holds an MA degree in British and North American Cultural Studies from the University of Freiburg, Germany. Currently, she's a doctoral student in English and American Studies at the University of Freiburg. And her PhD project is focused on rescue heroes in the US Armed Forces and their depiction in movies. The floor is yours. <laughs> OK, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and since uh, I, together with Edge, I'm organizing this lecture series, I'm especially delighted to be contributing to it. Uh, together with my fellow group members, Leah and Joshua. And as Edja just said, we're all working on topics that benefit from a culture memory studies lens. Um, and you can probably already tell that this session will be a little different than the other ones we've had so far. Um, but we believe that the three vastly different um, topics um, that we'll talk about uh, will overall help to understand culture memory studies better um, and the fact that it can be approached from an interdisciplinary um, point of view. And in order to showcase how diverse the concept of culture memory is and how it can be applied to different examples, I will first define some terms. Um, then Joshua will give an overview of his work in classics. We'll have some time for immediate questions concerning Joshua's talk. Um, then Leah will give a, uh, a quick overview on FEMA convents, and we'll have another quick um, break in which you can ask her questions on her topic specifically. I will then wrap up the session with more contemporary examples um, and try to draw a connection between our three inputs before we have a Q&A that um, spans all three talks and how they connect. Okay, let's dive right in. Um, it, we'll start with a theoretical introduction to our topics, and all three of us are working with the tension between individual and collective uh, memory making, and I will thus quickly explain um, how collective memory can be defined and why we use the term. Um, the term collective memory was introduced by Maurice Halplux in the year of 1925, who together with Evie Warburg at the Asmans was part of the first wave of memory studies. Um, if you remember the first talk by Hannah Teichler, she covered all the waves. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. Um, and the term describes, and here quote, one of the texts you had to read for the session, um, is a social process in which a society uh, or a social group constructs and reproduces its relation to the past. We thus look towards a shared collective memories to study social processes what is being remembered and how, what is forgotten or even consciously omitted. The study of collective memory is therefore the study of the process of how memory is being reconstructed. And the collective memories of a certain group can thus be closely linked to what we consider historical, but is not to be seen as synonymous with history. However, the term called uh, collective memory is not undisputed. Susan Sontag explained her critique of collective memory by describing remembering as an individual, unreproducible act, which consequently means that here, and I quote Sontag, collective memory is not a remembering, but a stipulating, end of quote. 
and that is rather tells the story of common ideas that we connect to certain emotions and images triggered by the ideologies connected to them. Um, but as Alida Asman stresses, the debate on whether or not collective memory is an adequate term is not very fruitful. The focus should be on the constructiveness of the memory-making processes. While it can be beneficial to be more precise during case studies and close readings, the term collective memory can be used as an overarching definition. This includes social, political, and cultural approaches, which are often interwoven. In our working group, we use the term collective memory to connect our topics and describe how the past is remembered in three different circumstances and how memories of the past are reproduced. The examples you will hear now will span different fields, approaches, and time frames, starting with Joshua Burgard's study of collective and individual griefs in antiquity. And I'll immediately give it over to you. The floor is yours. Yeah, hello everybody, and thank you for your nice introduction and the possibility to share my work here in this place. As you heard, I'm a classical philologist, which means that I work with languages, Old Greek and Latin. These languages and the period of time that may not be familiar to some of you, so I would like to give you a little or gentle introduction to what I'm doing in my PhD project. But if anything is unclear, please don't hesitate, hesitate to ask questions any time. In my PhD project, I'm working on the topic of collective and individual grief in antiquity. And for my research on grief and trauma, I find a Freudian perspective as mentioned in the, uh, by Eps, uh, you read, is really helpful for me, especially the book, The Inability to Mourn, Principle of Collective Behavior, written by Alexander and Marguerite Mitscherlich, is one of my theoretical frames. They are saying that after the Second World War, there was a kind of loose of reality and a partial glorification of the past in Germany. According to Mitscherlich, this phenomenon of a chaotic reception of the history is mainly due to the oral tradition of parents and grandparents. That is the point where you can see the connection between collective grief and collective memory. And like Mitchellish, I deal with collective grief during and after wars. In my case, I'm focusing on three wars, which you can see on the timeline. The first one are the Persian Wars from 419 until 479, in which the Persians invaded Greece and they were defeated by an alliance led by Athens and Sparta. Maybe you know the movie 300, where 300 Spartans fight against a huge Persian army. This happens. Uh, this happened in, during this war. After this, there was a time of about 50 years during which the cities Athens and Sparta became the two hegemonic powers in Greece. So there was a development time with little battles, but not a great war. In the Peloponnesian War, these two powers, Athens and Sparta, and their allies fought against each other. Sparta came out as the winner and ruled over Greece. A few years later, the Corinthian War broke out with nearly the same parties, but this time Athens won the war. And during this war, um, we have a very special text. This text has survived and passed down to our time a so-called epitaphios logos, which means funeral oration. I will soon give you more information about this oration, but first I would like to present my research questions. One, how are the former wars remembered in the funeral oration, and what can we learn from the way they are remembered in terms of mourning? Why can we answer the question with the epitaphios? Well, the epitaphios is a special little genre that only occurred in Athens, 
and has survived in only five texts. So it's not that much. It was a part of a public ceremony that was held once a year during a war to bury those who died in the war. This oration was held by a respected person who was elected by the city in front of a big crowd. At one point, it is emphasized that even women and foreigners were part of the crowd. This seems a little strange for us nowadays, but in antiquity, it was mo mostly men who were part of something. So it's special that even women, uh, women were part of this. The structure of the speech and the topics which are used are also largely fixed. After a short proomion and a dispositio, the main part of the speech is about the praise of the mythological and historical ancestors. Normally, there are no individual mentioned, even if there is a possibility. Athens is treated as a collective entity. After the praise, the living are asked to emulate the dead. Only at the end, the mourners are usually comforted. After this short overview, two things have become clear. Firstly, the epitaphios can be seen as a combination of the cultural and the communicative memory, because as a part of a ceremony, it is very fixed and deals with the mythological past. After, uh, but at the same time, it deals with the recent past, commemoration of the dead as a combination of both types of memories was already described by Jan Asman himself. And secondly, the genre of the epitaphios builds up a collective identity for the Athenians. This is the primary goal rather than providing comfort. As a final theoretical note, I want to show you that the form memory formats of Aleida Asman, which you were giving to read, also fit with the genre of the epitaphios. Firstly, we have the individual memory. One orator is given an oration in which he can incorporate his own autobiographical experience, the so-called episodic memory. Secondly, there is the social memory. The orator was elected by the city as their representative. He stands for the social memory of the current generation. These memories are embodied by the orator and become intergenerational. The last two formats starts with the political or national memory. For the epitaphios, this is the most important format because it is highly political and partly propagandistic oration. It generates a collective identity during the war to prepare the population to make individual sacrifice by fighting and, if necessarily, dying for the city. Last comes the cultural memory. In the epitaphios, we have this sort of memory at the beginning of the oration when the myth of origin are remembered. Within these last two formats, the memories are mediated and trans generational. Now let's look at the epitaphios. I would like to start with the structure of the oration. As I mentioned earlier, there's a proemium at the beginning followed by a short dispositio which states what the oration is about. So we get into it. Then we have the really huge part of the praise of the ancestors called Ep Ainos. This part makes up more than three quarters of the oration. Only a small part is dedicated to the glorious deeds of the mythological anchors. For example, the fights against the Amazon, militants, women from the East, or when Athens had the children of the famous hero Heracles, the most important or prominent hero amongst the heroes. Everything is presented as great, and Athens is always the winner. However, there's one detail that becomes important later. In the normal version of the fight against the Amazons, one Athenian plays a significant role, namely the king of Athens, Theseus. 
it is said that he had a relationship with an Amazon and kidnapped her, which is the reason why the Amazons attacked Athens. In the version of the, of the epitaph, it sounds like the Amazons had no special reasons for attacking Athens and just like or felt like doing so, hoping to gain glory. So you see, Athenian individuals are not allowed to be mentioned um, in the epitaph. Individuals which are allowed to be mentioned are great enemies like in the last myth in which the Athenians protect the children of Heracles from Oristois, who attacks them with a huge army. The mythological praise is short, but it's important as it prepares and foreshadows the topics of the historical praise, which is the largest part of the oration. You see many stuff. As you can see, the Persian Wars, especially the second one against Xerxes, are narrated in much more detail than the other historical events. So I will focus on this. If you zoom in, you can realize that one battle, the Battle of Salamis, is dealt with intensively. Moreover, this happens in the middle of the speech with father, emphasize the importance of this battle. To complete the structure of the oration at the end, there is a short part of lamentation and an even shorter part of consolation. The consolation is only these five paragraphs, so no, not much. This focus on the Battle of Salamis is surprising because the most remembered battle of the Persian Wars is the Battle of Marathon. Today, the battle is known for the marathon run because it is said that the ambassador who brought the news of the victory to Athens ran the distance from Marathon on foot and died after delivering the message. One amusing anecdote, now, uh, one amusing anecdote. nowadays the distance of the marathon is uh, 42.195 kilometers, but the distance from Marathon to Athens is a little less, a little bit less. The difference in length has something to do with the royal family. And I would like to share this story with you because we are in an English setting here. In 98, the Summer Olympics took place in London and the route of the marathon was from the Windsor Castle to the Olympic Stadium. This route was chosen so the royal family had a great view of the start, but it was longer than normal. So everyone who runs a marathon can thank the royal family for some extra meters. But let's get back to the origin and the battle of Marathon. In the Epitaphios, the so-called king of Asia, Darius, whose name is not mentioned, wants to increase his power and conquer Europe. He comes to Marathon to fight mainly against Athens. There is no description of the battle, but a short praise of the Athenian fighters and at the end the importance of their victory and sacrifice for all of Greece is emphasized. Let's compare this representation of the most famous battle with the depiction of the Battle of Salamis, which is also very important, but in terms of reception, mostly uncomparable. First, it also begins with the naming of the enemy and Again, it's the king of Asia who wants to conquer Europe, but this time his name Xerxes is mentioned in the text. His hybris or arrogance against the gods is described. So he is not only depicted as the enemy of Greece, but also of all gods. The magnitude of the battle is also made clear by the fact that it's stylized as the battle between the continents of Asia and Europe, so a big clash of the continents. And the continents represented the East, Asia, and the West, Greece. Just before the battle is to begin, it is described that the Athenians eyed the dilemma, because the Spartans lost a very important battle before. Because of the defeat, the Athenians would have to fight on land at, and at sea at the same time 
which they cannot do in terms of strength. strength. No matter what they choose, Athens would be destroyed. Nevertheless, they decide in favor for the sea battle to fight for the freedom of Greece. In contrast to the Battle of Marathon, the prehistory is described in much more details here, so that the importance and intensity is emphasized much more strongly. Then comes the battle description, which is a rhetorical masterpiece. I could show you a neurological and cognitive scientific analysis of this passage, but unfortunately, I don't have enough time for it, and it would be all Greece words, so that would be not the point here. My point is that this passage is highly emotionally charged through this kind of description. So, in the middle of the oration, we find a heroic description of the Battle of Salamis, which is quite unusual, but the most unusual is yet to come. At the end of the passage, the Athenian leader, Themistocles, is mentioned by name, which is not common as I showed you. With all these points, I think it becomes clear that there must be something special about this episode, and I think I found the reason for this with the findings of the memory studies. For this, I have to go back to the timeline which I showed you at the beginning of my talk. On the slide, I had also added the important battles that are mentioned. So, on the bottom, I hope you can see it. The date when the Epitaphios was written is not quite sure. That's often a problem in, my, uh, in the classics. But the Cominius Opinio dates it around the year uh, 391, which is very beneficial uh, for my interpretation. If you add the structure of the cultural and communicative memory, you can see that we have two matches. Firstly, the beginning of the Peloponnesian War fits with the 40 years border, which Asman describes as a special cut within the communicative uh, memory. Secondly, the Battle of Salamis can be located between the time span of the cultural and communicative memory, the so-called floating gap. The time structure should, of course, um, to be treated with caution but as I showed you, the Battle of Salamis marked an important cut in duration. Although the important battle is won, Athens is destroyed by the Persians. I can also demonstrate this cut on the verbal level. I can promise these are the only Greek words I show you today on the uh, right side. Um, before the Battle of Salamis, the city, here Polis, and the ancestor Progonoi, Polis Progonoi, are mostly used in an emphasized form. The city is emphasized with a demonstrative pronoun, this, this city, not any city, this city. And the ancestors are emphasized with the possessive pronoun of the first person plural, our. During the battle, there is a shift from the emphasized to the unemphasized form. And after the battle, the emphasized form is no longer appear. So this border can connect it with the memory, but also on the verbal level. Therefore, I think that the Battle of Salamis, as it described in the Epitaphios, can be seen as the border of the cultural and communicative memory. Additionally, a connection can be made with the other two later battles mentioned in the Epitaphios. In the Battle of Geranea, the old and the young had to fight together in order to win. This emphasizes how important it is to learn from our ancestors. And I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb when I say that the old ones are the fighters of Salamis. It could be a match. Since this is the only fight mentioned in 50 years, the selective character become clear. The whole Peloponnesian War is virtually left out because it can be seen as an Athenian trauma. The final sea battle is shortly mentioned in which the Athenian fleet was completely destroyed by Sparta. 
Shortly after the walls of Athens were destroyed, yeah, yeah. therefore I think that the emphasis on Spartan complicity in the destruction of Athenian of Athenian during the Persian War can be traced back to the trauma of the Peloponnesian War. As a result of the interpretation, I would say that in the Epitaphios, mostly the cultural memory is remembered and the communicative memory is mostly forgotten. This can be well explained with the seven types of forgetting by Aleda Asman, but some parts of the communicative memory are incorporated into the remembrance of the Battle of Salamis. I hope that I could show you and make clear what I'm doing in my PhD project. I have shown you that you can analyze collective grief within the terms of collective memory so that the connection is created. For this, I use the Epitaphios, a funeral oration that can be analyzed on the basis of the four formats of memory according to Aleda Asman. And as a final point, I would like to emphasize that in the Epitaphios, there is a tension between remembering and forgetting. So memory studies is not only about what is remembered, but also what is forgotten. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. So I will hand over to Leah. So thank you for this really interesting first part, Joshua, and I hope I can continue in the same manner. Um, to start with hello again, everyone, and thank you for the nice introduction and the possibility to speak here today. As you have heard, I am a Germanist, so I study texts of a language that at least some of you speak. Nevertheless, earlier stages of this language are not always naturally understood, even by native German speakers. The texts I focus on for my PhD project are written in early New High German and are influenced by dialects, as the standardized form of German language did not exist during that time. When I quote texts here today, I provide English translations done by me on the slides, but I will read the quote to you in early New High German to give you a little demonstration of the original sound. As Joshua did before, I will go into the historical context and I will try to explain necessary aspects and terms. If you still have any questions, please feel free to ask at any time. Unfortunately, there is not enough time in this session today to present my entire PhD project, which is about the historiography of a female convent around 1500 and the reception of this historiography since the 19th century. Therefore, I will limit myself to the first part of my thesis, the nun's historiography. But what exactly is my thesis about? Basically, I am interested in how events become history, specifically how events are organized and perspectivized when narrating them in a given context for a given purpose. The particular case I am working on is the Nuremberg Poor Claire's Convent, whose nuns wrote two chronicles about its history. In my contribution to today's lecture, I would like to present both texts and their historical backgrounds that link the older to the more recent one. For me, they are a vivid example of how institutions make their memory, as Aleda Asman has put it in the paper we gave you to read as preparation for today. So let's start with a very basic question. What are poor Claire's? Um, among the monastic orders, the Franciscans, like the Dominicans, should be considered as relatively young, both having been founded at the beginning of the 13th century and also both named after their founders. By way of comparison, what relatively young means, the first Christian monastic order was founded by Benedict of Nursia in the 6th century, so some time ago. And both communities, that of St. Dominic and that of St. Francis of Assisi, were orders consisting of male members only. 
while St. Dominic himself founded an additional women's order, the so-called Second Order of St. Dominic, to distinguish it from the main's First Order, the case was different for St. Francis. It was not he himself, but one of his followers, Claire of Assisi, who founded a women's order with his support, which only after her death was called the Order of Claire and became the second order of St. Francis. Because of this, female Franciscans bear the name Poor Claire's and can refer to their own founder as a role model who also presided over the community at its, as its first abbess and was canonized just like Dominic and Francis. We will now look at the poor class of Nuremberg. The convent was founded in 1279. The main source for its history from its beginnings until the 15th century is the so-called poor class chronicle. The first of the two chronicles I'm focusing on. Interestingly, it has a preliminary section that recounts the founding of the order um, by Francis and Claire. As the text is partly organized according to the convent's abbesses, whose names and terms of office are listed, a line of tradition is established that extends from the order's founder to the current office holder and thus generates legitimacy. The poor class chronicle has survived in three versions. The so-called Latin chronicle was written around 1501 as a rough draft by the Franciscan monk Nicolaus Glasberger, who stood in close contact with the Nuremberg convent during this time. This is due to women not having been allowed to take on priestly duties within the Catholic Church, uh, Church Catholic Church, and for this reason, members of the male orders were entrusted with these tasks for female convents. This Latin text by Glasberger was subsequently translated and reworked by the poor class, which resulted in the concept of the so-called German Chronicle. This one, in turn, was then transferred into a proper manuscript, and the value that the poor class attached to this text, representing their own history that they had written themselves, is already evident at first glance in the execution of the manuscript. And even if you don't know anything about medieval and early modern manuscripts, this becomes clear when comparing the manuscripts with the German Chronicle. So this one is the German Chronicle, and this is a little bit of biased representation because this one is only black and white, um, but it also has no colors in it, no initials that are decorated or something, no decoration at all. You can say that the layout is a little bit topsy-turvy, and this is how the whole text is. It even gets worse. And this is the manuscript, the proper manuscript. So you can see it's completely different. It has a proper layout, and it even has um, some gold initials. So it also has a higher material status. The central subject of the poor class chronicle is the reform of the convent in 1452. The founders of the religious orders usually wrote rules in which they documented the principles of monastic life. The one written by the aforementioned Benedict of Nursia, the Regula Benedicti, Benedicti, is certainly the most well known. Throughout the Middle Ages, it was noticed repeatedly that the orders began to observe the rules increasingly less strictly as time went on. As a result, many times reforms were enacted to stop this process and return to the rule-bound life that the founders originally intended. In the Poor Class Chronicle, the reform of 1452 becomes the center point of the convent's history, as the text is explicitly divided into a part before and a part after the event. One should bear in mind that the chronicle was written half a century after the reform was carried out. Because of this, it is safe to assume that this reform must have been of lasting importance to the community. On the other hand, the question arises as to why the chronicle has not been written earlier. This brings me to the aspect of conflict that is mentioned in the title of today's lecture. For the second half of the, from the second half of the 15th century onwards, there was a general increase in the documentation of everyday matters and practical knowledge. The written material produced in religious communities during that time and intended for their own use served, quote, in a similar way to establish identity and self-assurance or to safeguard status, rights, and interests in times of crisis as did the written records produced in secular circles, 
as Almut Breitenbach and Eva Schlothauber explain. For members of reformed female convents, the aspect of coping with crisis was particularly important. This aspect might also constitute the background of the Nuremberg Poor Class Chronicle. Beginning at the middle of the 15th century, immediately after the reform, the convent was repeatedly in conflict with the city government of Nuremberg, with the Bishop of Bamberg and the tenants on monastic land. It is quite probable that these constant conflicts finally gave reason to the creation of the Chronicle, as the text could be used as a handbook-like aid in solving a wide variety of problems, thanks to the inserted documents from the convent archive. The poor class Chronicle thus combines different text types and links historiographical, legal and economic content. This is not unusual for late medieval chronicles of female convents. In the convent's everyday life, these records played a role beyond historiography and rather, rather of it, quote, the written form of an inner conventual self-administration and self-assurance, which served as a guideline and corrective of their, which is the conventional's, spiritual life. To quote Schlopenhäuber again, I would like to draw your attention to the interaction of the nuns with the convent's own archive in this process. The textual form of the poor class chronicle can be described in two ways, either as a narrative of the monastery's history with inserted documents or as a catulary with a narrative framework. And if you don't know, a catulary is just a um, manuscript of copies of documents, so a collection of copied doc documents. In both cases, the creation of the chronicle was based on a careful examination of the preserved documents. In Asman's words, the convent took its archival memory and selected from it was what was to be served in the active memory of the chronicle. Through the multi-step creation process, we can see quite clearly how the poor Claire's turned history in general into our history, spoken from their perspective. In this way, this community made its memory and at the same time formed its identity as a reformed, self-determined and exemplary convent. To conclude my remarks in the Poor Class Chronicle, I quote a sentence that stands at the border between the two parts the text consists of and puts what I have said in a nutshell. So in middle, uh, in the German version it is, nun werden für das andere Teil gesetzt die Geschichte, die sich in der heiligen Observanz verlaufen hat. Und allein die Dinge, die allermeist not sind, dass das selbst hat die Andacht der Schwester zu Gedächtnis der vergangenen Dinge, auf das sie, das, auf das sie sich mögen regieren, auch in den Dingen, die künftiglich noch zu tun wären. And it's quite different to translate this, but I hope that is more or less understandable um, what the English translation says. So what you have here is um, this... Um, aspect of the reform, which is the center point of the history. You also have this aspect of commemoration, and you have this aspect of selection out of the archive, as it says, only the most necessary thing. And finally, you have this aspect of self-determination, as it says, it is for the nuns to govern themselves, not only now, but also in the future. We make a time leap forwards and move on to the second, more recent chronicle of the convent, which was written during the Protestant Reformation. We don't know when exactly it was composed, but it was certainly written much closer to the events than the Poor Claire's Chronicle. Presumably, this was due to the extent of the underlying conflict of this text, which made it important to document all of the affairs as soon as possible. In addition, the poor Claire's chronicle already provided a template as to, how to, as to how to write history concerning the convent. Both texts are hence structured the same way. Before I look into this chronicle, um, I will provide you with a few historical points of reverence. During the Easter time of 1525, the Nuremberg religious colloquies took place. Um, they were to decide the future religious and thus also political position of the imperial city, either staying with the old faith or converting to Protestantism. Between the 3rd and the 14th of March, six sessions were held in front of the town hall, attended by a large crowd to discuss 12 articles approved by the city government. Following Luther's principle of the sola scriptura, so only the script, only the Bible, only the Bible was permitted as a basis for arguments brought forth. 
the victory of the Protestant side resulted in the handover of four monasteries located on city land to the city government, as well as the government's appropriation of ecclesiastical sovereign rights over the remaining communities. While most of the monasteries complied with these new directives without presenting a significant opposition, the poor Claire's convent under its abbess Caritas Pilkheimer put up persistent resistance. The second chronicle was written by the nuns about their assistance to the new Protestant faith and reformation measures. The text is now today by its modern title, the Memoirs or Memorabilia of Caritas Pilkheimer. It is a little bit an a weird title and um, has really nothing to do with um, this text is actually about. I've already written my master thesis on this text and a lot could be said about it, especially regarding its reception in later times, the times where also this title comes from. For today, however, I will limit myself to one episode, which I will use to demonstrate how the community's identity established in the Poor Claire's Chronicle is the basis for the evaluation of the incidents during the Protestant Reformation, and how, as a consequence, the making of memory always has to do with the perspectivization of events. In my opinion, the aforementioned episode, which is placed towards the end of the text, is particularly interesting because it shows an apparent balancing act. After emphasizing during the whole narrative that the convent was unanimous in its opposition to the measures of the city government, it suddenly appears that one of the nuns was quite open to Lutheran ideas and disturbed the community with her behavior. At least that is how the text presents it. Such behavior and the person who displayed it should better be excluded from a chronicle about feats of resistance. However, the text mentions that the whole city knew about this incident. Therefore, the poor Claire's had to integrate it in their chronicle in order to claim serenity of interpretation over the event and justify themselves to posterity. Still, the renegade, Anna Schwarz, was clearly not given too much space in the text itself, which tells us, von dieser Person wäre viel zu schreiben, dass wir doch um des Pesten wegen unterwegen lassen und allein ein wenig schreiben. So, much wood. We could say a lot of it, but I'm not to do it. Um, according to the Chronicles account, Anna's offenses were manifold. She likes to listen to Reformation servants and gebraucht sich lutherischer Freiheit. This is also really hard to translate because maybe you know um, this pamphlet by Luther which is about the freedom of a Christian person and this um, somehow um, yes, plays with this expression. Um, yes, so she likes to listen to Reformation sermons and gebraucht sich lutherischer Freiheit by ignoring reprimands and behaving hostile towards those who discipline her. She wants to be an abbess herself because she considers herself learned and skillful and furt ein Wiederorden. This is also a little bit hard to translate. It means she establishes another order inside the order, so to say. Um, and she does this by sleeping when one eats and eating when one prays. None of the nuns likes being around her. The description is recognizably biased, regardless of whether it is true or not. Everything connected to the Protestant Reformation is considered bad, and Lover's concept of freedom is equa equated with arbitrary action. Anna is also portrayed as presumptuous and disobedient, which means that her behavior does not at all correspond to that expected of a rule observant poor Claire. Her worst offense, however, lies in the counter order she leads amongst the other nuns. This signifies an open disregard for the abbess's authority as well as a refusal to fulfill her duties as a nun within the convent and ultimately shows her disdain for observance to the rules. Anna's portrayal in the chronicle is thus severely discredited. Her fellow nuns, on the other hand, are not guilty of breaking the rule, despite the persistent provocations, as they are merely trying to secure Anna's salvation and not to leave her to the false prophets of the Reformation. In the description of the attempts made to persuade her to return to the old faith, the convent is shown as having a single shared cons conscience. In order to intercept the fact that there is not just one opinion within the community, the unity of the rest of the convent must obviously be particularly emphasized in order to make Anna a one-time 
exception. Anna eventually left the convent and we know that she married a former Nuremberg abbot. Apart from this, there's no other textual evidence of her life and, ironically, if her fellow nuns had not written about her, we would know practically nothing about her. Above all, there are no personal testimonies from her that would allow us to take a look into her individual autobiographical memory. If we had such testimonies, we could know what her opinion on the events and the behavior of the other nuns was. Nevertheless, it should be noted that we still would not know what really happened. Thus, Anna Schwarz is also a vivid example of how an individual fate can, ch can challenge institutional memory and even threaten the collective identity of a community. In this specific case, the community reacted with shaping the record of the incident according to its own ideological orientation. I hope I was able to give you a comprehensible example of how the memory making of an institution can work and say thank you very much for your attention. Okay, then I hand over to you again, Christina. Okay, hello once again. Um, after hearing the two talks on collective memory making processes of past groups, I'll now give a more contemporary example to round off this session. Um, and I will first explain the connection between culture, memory, and war movies, uh, but then also um, talk about how collective memory plays a role in this connection. Uh, first, I want to mention that wars are an especially prominent way of memory making and prone to be used to push certain agendas and ideologies. Alex Lubin describes this as follows, and I quote, wars are utilized to explain in a particularly cultural, geopolitical, and economic moment while repressing or projecting onto others previous incidents of US-led state violence. They are thus narrated and remembered in a certain way, and the reasons why and by whom certain stories are promoted over others is of particular interest to me. I therefore look at war films as objects of cultural memory that may give an insight into what aspects of war are being remembered and which are being omitted, especially in regard to heroic figures and their antagonists. They use in the construction of societal values and manifestation in culture objects, such as war memorials, constitute important aspects of cultural memory connected to the US military. Heroic figures such as war, movie, uh, war heroes and heroines can, as Barbara Corte explains in her work on British spies, serve as an empty shell that can be used to address the risk of the security of society and project, to loosen, and project solutions onto. In the case of my research, um, I look at instances of rescue in U.S. war films to investigate the questions of how the savior figure of the U.S. war hero or heroine addresses the insecurities of the American society and why the reproduction of the rescue on screen is deemed to be an important part of remembering warfare. Being seen as a counter-heroization, as well, Fondenhoff describes it, rescue heroes shift the focus from a hypermasculine, violent hero to that of a protector and rescuer. While ultimately still supporting the institution of the US military, the values they supposedly subscribe to, as well as American exceptionalism at large. Rescue heroes or heroines in general are fundamental to the understanding uh, of the conflicts between and cohesion of modern and pre-modern societies. By embodying the heroic ideal and thus being a vessel for the anxieties and values of a society, they point towards a larger uh, political points of contention and cohesion. Regarding war films, the medium itself is also of importance. When looking at war films, the question arises how war is remembered and re-remembered. Moreover, by connecting war with the entertainment industry, the audience experiences an object of militament, as Roger Stahl calls it. He goes on to say that through war being presented and viewed as entertainment, the movie is, and here I quote Stahl again, recruiting its audience as virtual citizen soldiers. The audience is thus being actively invited to subscribe to the ideals the US military perpetuates. Um, cultural memory and thus the public opinion of war is consequently controlled 
by, and I quote, distancing, distracting, and disengaging the citizen from the realities of war, as Stahl puts it. Using the way war is represented in movies, the values and concept one connects with war and remembers when recalling instances of US-led warfare intermingle with historical facts. As Marita Sturken puts it in her work on Tangled Memories, many, and here I quote, Vietnam veterans say they have forgotten where some of their memories came from, their own experiences, documentary photographs, or Hollywood movies. Films are thus an essential tool in shaping narratives surrounding war for military personnel, veterans, and civilians alike. Some examples for the rescue scenes in war movies I look at include Forrest Gump by Robert Zemeckis from 1994, which works with a lot of humor and comedic relief. The 2001 war movie Black Hawk Down by Ridley Scott, which investigates the limits of the saying, no man gets left behind, a concept intertwined with what audience connect with the US military and which triggers memories or other war films which have played with the idea, um, such as Steven Spielberg's 1998 movie Saving Private Ryan. Connected to the metaphor of the shepherd protecting his sheep, the religious connotations and pacifistic tendencies in Hacksaw Ridge are helpful in investigating the overlap between the US military and Christian faith. In the 2016 war film by Mal Gibson, the intermingling between religion and cultural memory became, uh, become apparent, as we could already see in Leia's talk. Um, my last example is the 2019 war film, The Last Full Measure by Todd Robinson which uses an intergenerational approach to express the tension of the civilian military gap experienced in the US today. The dissonance between the realities and memories of members of the US armed forces and American civilians is striking and points towards the differences of collective memories within US culture and cultural memory. And now we get to the last part of today's session and the question, what connects our topics? First, as we try to make clear, culture memory is an attempted agency of legitimization of authority and social cohesion. So we always have an underlying power dynamic on who gets to drive a certain narrative, whether that are politicians, authors, or even the media industry of Hollywood. Secondly, as Astrid Earl stresses, culture memory is always constructed and always contested. No memory is forever fixed. Rather, it can be adjusted depending on who tells or retells the story, and to what audience. Thirdly, by looking at a single phenomenon, we can trace it throughout history and analyze it through a culture memory lens, taking its different tellings and retellings into account. Some of the examples you have already heard today are historical writings or rewritings, as well as grieving and rescue and war. Finally, we want to stress that cultural memory can be approached transculturally and benefit from an interdisciplinary approach. Thank you so much for listening. You can find my sources here. And uh, let us know if you have any questions, comments that kind of go in a larger direction of collective memory, culture memory. But you can also ask again uh, specific questions um, regarding Leah's and Joshua's talk. Thank you so much.